Hey, what's up, y'all? Welcome to a bit of a different game day. Not really a game day, more of an unboxing day. Let's go with that. Unboxing day with heavy cardboard. Uh, so today, I just got back, yet. well, all right, I just got back yesterday from yesterday, day before. Today's Tuesday. Got back Sunday from Origins Game Fair. And while I was at Origins Game Fair, I had a couple of meetings with one of our partners, and partners for sponsored playthroughs, and that is the folks over at Ion Game Design. That is Yoon Munker, uh, Phil Eklund, Matt Eklund, uh, Paul, and I apologize for not knowing Paul's name, and then there's Besame, who didn't make the trip. So during this meeting, uh, they showed me a couple of their upcoming games, Pax Transhumanity, which I'm super stoked for, as well as Bios Origins. And we talked about scheduling for the playthroughs and teaches, so on and so forth. We also discussed the upcoming High Frontier 4th Edition, which is going to be hitting Kickstarter the day after uh, Essen begins. Craziness. But while I was there, uh, Phil Eklund was kind enough to give a very brief very broad overview of what BIOS Origins is about. If you're unfamiliar with the uh, BIOS series, this is the third game, but I'll get into that uh, here in a little bit. Moral of the story is this. While I was there and I was sitting down and interviewing Yoon, uh, Phil Eklund sat down with a couple of patrons and was going over uh, how to play BIOS Origins and kind of walking them through it. And then after he got done, uh, and we got done with the interview, I said, so what do you guys think? And they were like, wow, there's a lot of stuff. This all sounds awesome. Can't wait. I have no idea how you're going to teach this. And I was like, you know what? I have no idea how I'm going to teach this game either. And so we got to talking a little bit about this. And Phil overheard us, because he's right there, as did Yoon. And the copy of BIOS Origins that they had is the only one in existence. It's what they call a digital prototype. It looks like the finished game, uh, except I think maybe not the wooden components, etc. But all of the printed materials look like they are the uh, published game. It is currently at the factory. It's supposed to be available uh, around se late September, early, let, let's call it late August, or sometime in September. And Phil was nice enough to say, hey, why don't we give you this copy so you and your game group can play through it a couple times and you can get a better feel on how to teach this game. Well, let's go through it together, shall we? I have not read the rules. I have a very brief knowledge of it. I have not played the original edition. This is the second edition. But that said, let's go ahead and get into it, shall we? So, yeah. Let's get to it. So there you go, BIOS Origin. So as you can see, this is not your typical uh, PAX game box size. It is, oh shoot, I wanna say about eight inches by eight inches and about yay thick, all right? So there you go. Now, everything that you see here is a prototype. Let me stress that, okay? Uh, literally everything is pretty close to how it is. However, just understand this is not the finished form. So you can see one to four players, two to four hours. Uh, they said it's going to run long your first game. Um, and obviously that's going to be entirely dependent on the number of players. All right. So welcome everybody watching live. So here we go. Also, I want to point out that everything has already been punched. Um, I have seen all this because this was the only copy that they had. And so they were showing this off at Origins Game Fair. So here we go. Second edition. So eh, everything fits in a box. It really does. Um, so I'm going to pull all of these things out. and We'll go through them a little bit by a little bit. So the rule book. We'll cover this here in a little bit. We have the four brains, which again, we'll be going through all of these piece by piece. Your kind of player tableau areas here, double-sided on all of those. Punch boards, 
That's that's all of them. That's it. Hmm. Get the board out. The Rosetta Stone. <laughs> all right, there we go. And the board. So now we're going to go ahead and zoom out to give you guys a better look at the main board itself. So this is going to be entirely dependent on those of you watching live right now, how detailed you want to be, how much do you want to go through, do you want to see what the setup looks like, the whole nine yards. This is your unboxing and overview, so you guys are going to need to tell me what it is that you want to see, all right? So that is the main board. Now this really is the quintessential civilization game. You're going to, well, I'll go over all of that here in a little bit. You have three tracks. You have the cultural or environment here, cultural down in this area. You have uh, politics and you have industry, economy, welfare, environment, etc. You have the main board out here. As you can see, now this board is double-sided depending on what kind of game you want to play. So this is maritime or ocean only, okay? No continents on there. However, you know what? Yeah, we'll, we'll start with this, just showing you guys and not going over the details yet, all right? All right, so this is for maritime and no continents, so sea-based creatures, this being both or land-based creatures there, okay? Let me, turn, let me turn the brightness down now that the, the board is actually out here. A little bit there. Nah, now it's too dark. There we go, we'll leave it as it was. All right. All right. Um, yeah, we're gonna go through components little by little, but while you guys are looking at this, I thought I would read the overview that's in the rule book here for y'all, all right? You are one of four subspecies of predatory apes traveling through four epochs of synthetic language development. At first, your calls are merely for external signaling in Epoch 1, but then you start using your words internally to organize what you observe, solve problems, or to store memories. Epoch 2 marks the sudden appearance of art, music, cave paintings, jewelry, figurines, and grave goods. In Epoch 3, the origins of consciousness, you are able to reconstruct mental scenes with yourself as an actor, the first fantasies, free will, and a sense of time. You're able to set your own goals for victory in Epoch 4, which can be religious, political, or industrial disciplines. As you progress through the epochs, you set foundations and technological milestones for your civilization. If you suffer too much chaos, your core foundations suffer dissidents, which shut them down. If they revolt, the ruling class changes to either religious, political, or industrial. All right. Now the victory, it says. At the dawn of each new epoch, accumulate victory chits according to how well your mysticism in Epoch 2, your urbanization in Epoch 3, or diversity in Epoch 4 compares with that of your opponents. These chits are added to your final endgame scoring in three categories. Cultural, for which environment and mysticism are important. Political, for which welfare and cities are important. Or industrial, for which economy and diversity are important. You will normally be graded only on your highest score. So if you do well in all three disciplines, you'll lose to someone who does great in just one. However, a token on the map's philosophy track, uh, sorry, uh, however, a token on the map's philosophy track can restrict which disciplines are scorable. So if you manage to change the global philosophy to shut down your opponent's best score, you may win 
after all. Now, this edition of BIOS Origins is an, wait for it, evolutionary descendant of Origins, the original game, but reworked to be the third game in a trilogy that starts with BIOS Genesis, the origins of life on Earth, and continues with BIOS Megafauna 2, Life Gets Big and Invades the Land, which that we've previously done a playthrough of. Play BIOS Origins either as an independent game or as the concluding part of a BIOS trilogy campaign covering the entirety of life on Earth or even hypothetical histories of life on Mars or Venus if you played with those variants in BIOS Megafauna 2. Now, one other cool thing is you can actually take the end game state of this here and transfer it over into the upcoming High Frontier as well, all right? Now, the player roles. In BIOS Origins, it's much different from your typical civilization game that you set, settle into a role of a supreme dictator whose task is to deploy obedient pawns in a manner to rule the world. Your job here is not to build stadiums if your pawns are bored or schools if they're ignorant. Instead, you are the pawns and your goal is to prosper and set your own goals while avoiding the disaster of a supreme dictator. You start the game in Epoch 1 as an emotional, social, possibly promiscuous and verbally, and, and verbally communicative. You start as a distinct subspecies, but this player role changes with each new epoch. As interbreeding makes the differences between the various subspecies unimportant, the players become distinguished by different languages in Epoch 2. The interchange of ideas leads to different religions in Epoch 3 and different ideologies in Epoch 4. The game represents two possible timelines. The first wave of Homo erectus, who m migrated out of Africa two million years ago, or the second wave of Homo sapiens that migrated out of Africa around 100,000 years ago. So there you go. That's kind of the big picture on, you know, what just this simple looking board provides. All right. <laughs> uh, all right. So let's go through here. So before we do so, I suppose, let's go ahead and let me zoom in a bit. And let me show you guys what the rule book looks like. Now, there is a ton of information here. And I am, a, it is a little bit intimidating when you first look at it. But here's the good news about this rule book. So everything that you see down here in tiny print all are little footnotes, all right? So if you notice here, as we're going through, so even at the very beginning of the introduction, you're, uh, you are one of four subspecies of predator apes traveling through four epochs of synthetic language development. And then it has a little thing for footnote one. You come down here and it has a little thing. It, this is all uh, history and, and, and theme. Uh, it's labeled language. Then in the beginnings was the word, what makes us human, uh, human racial differences, and all of that. So if you're just looking at it as a rule book and not worried about the flavor aspect of it, you can actually cut all of that out. Everything that I just read to y'all is here and here, has big picture meta rules, then a sequence of play right here, through there, then the components and the anatomies, which we're going to basically be going over in this overview here, okay? And then some more overview here, as well as there and there. And then once we reach here, we start getting to the different types of setup, okay? You have a couple of different choices. You have a basic or an advanced game. You have classic, custom, or a custom Kraton map, which is going to use uh, components from BIOS Megafauna 2, and then do you want land or marine realm? And then the advanced game, is it the first or second dispersal? So these are all different variants that you have to decide how you're going to play this game, okay? Then, now we actually get into the heart of the actual setup. And now with all this white on the board, I will drop that down a little bit. There we go. So setup here, there, through here, okay, is for land folk non-campaign, meaning you didn't start with BIOS Genesis and go to BIOS Megafauna 2 and then into BIOS Origins, then here is your setup for that. 
However, right here, if you want to play the more merfolk non-campaign, meaning on the other side of the board, there's the setup for that. Then there's the Euro variant, landfolk versus merfolk here, and then how to set up a custom Kraton map uh, using the Kratons from Bios Megafauna 2, and then a setup for Bios Earth Campaign continued from Bios Megafauna here and there. There is the setup for the solo variants, um, a non-campaign, and then a solo campaign set up right through there. So all of that, we're now at page 9 of the rule book. All right. So then we get into arenas, chaos, and revolutions, the six arenas of play, which you're looking at these down here on the bottom of the board. Goes into, and you'll notice almost half this page is taken up by footnotes, right? And this is actually going through the actual teaching of how to play the game, okay, the different phases, so on and so forth. Everything that you see in dark blue has to do with the advanced game. And as you can see, the advanced game there. And right there stops, that is the end of the game at the very beginning of page 21. So if we go back to the beginning of the actual rules here, and I'm doing this as much for my sake as much as for y'all's, because I'm gonna have to be the one teaching this on screen. Uh, right here, this little part starting here for on page nine starts the rules, and this little bit on page 21. So for all intents and purposes, the rules go from page 10 to page 20, all right? Really not that bad. All of this is the advanced game, as you can see by the dark blue. Footnotes down below, all of that. More of the advanced game through here. But here is a sample two-player advanced game right through there. Different tips on what to do. Then how to transition to High Frontier. How to take the in-game state from this to go into High Frontier. And then there's an essay back here from Phil Eklund, a little historical, uh, what the game, what the world looked like in Epoch 3, historically. And then a glossary back here at the back of the rule book. All right. So again, keep in mind, all of this is prototype, even though it's pretty close. Um, so let's go ahead and start talking about some of the things that you guys can see here on the board. All right, so we'll start with the world map, and I'll go ahead and uh, let's go ahead and zoom out first to show you guys the whole map again for those that just arrived. A little far. There we go. Let's let's take it to right there. Okay. All right. No pressure, red eye ghost. A moment. Let me get some tea. All right, so what are you guys looking at here? We're kind of going over this together. So I'm learning this as we go here too. It says, the world map, the map is double-sided as I showed you. The campaign side features an archipelago and the classic side, this being the classic side, depicts the continents in their present configuration. Both sides have these features. So we have different hexes. The map is composed of hexes, occasionally truncated to four or five corners. Each hex can contain one city or one climate chit. And I'm sure you guys are interested, so let's go ahead and break out some of the wooden components as they are here. And these actually might be it. So as you can see, so it's basically a double uh, height normal wooden block. So it's a wooden block. These uh, cuboids, uh, I assume, are going to go there. The city cuboids, they're stored along the urbanization track of your color on the lowest center of the map right here. If you create a city, move the less mo leftmost cuboid on this track 
to the hex where you've created the city so as to cover the appropriate resource icon there. If one of your cities is destroyed, move it back to the rightmost space. All right, easy enough. So these cuboids, as you can see there, are actually going to be going out here on the board. These represent the cities. All right, each hex can contain one city or one climate chit. Now, there are spots. Each of the corners of a hex contains a spot, as you can see all around there. And now that we're talking about that, go and zoom in a bit, move that over so you guys can see different spots, okay? Each can hold one migrant figure. A migrant figure, we have a few different pieces of wood that I'm going to attempt. There we go. There, and I think that's all the wooden pieces there. There are two kinds of spots. There are land, light brown, obviously, and there are water, the wavy blue. Each spot has a colored backdrop to show the starting location of each player's migrants. Four spots are for the merfolk variant, four for the land variant. And I'm looking around the board to see... Hmm. Uh, all right. Some hexes contain a 20-pointed yellow star indicates a catastrophe. The Roman numeral in the center indicates in which epoch the catastrophe might strike. So let's try and find one, shall we? Ah, I have found one. So, we'll zoom in on that. Stop that, camera. Let's try that again. Oh, because I have it. You know what? We're going to change something real quick. A moment while I do so. I'm actually going to have to, if I'm going to zoom out or zoom in and zoom out, I'm going to have to change the focus. Give me just a moment here, guys. All right. Let's see if that works a little bit better. Sorry about that. Hey, that works a whole lot better. There we go. All right, so as we can see, there is one of those 20-sided stars right there, and uh, a catastrophe might could happen in Epoch 3, as it says. Then there are climate rings, a hex containing a white, blue, orange, or green ring indicates that it contain an, can contain an ice, seed, desert, or jungle climate shit, respectively. If there are star icons in the 10 o'clock position of the ring, the hex may start with the climate shit during, and it, show, it says 2CF, referencing later on in the rule book. So you can see some of these climate rings as you, like so. All right. Then, zooming back out a little bit, it says each hab habitable hex contains one or two resource icons. If this icon is a white, it's horticulture or biofuel, which can be exploited by a uh, cultivate action. If the icon is brown, it's animal, which can be exploited by a domesticate action. And if the icon is black, it's mineral, luxury oil, luxury oil or uranium, which can be exploited by a prospect action. All right. And it says note, Animals with an Earth icon are work animals, and with a Mars icon are war animals. Some ideas require either a work or a war animal. War animals are further distinguished because they enable Blitzkrieg, and talks about later on. All right. So this is going over the details of what these various hexes can contain. You can prospect black resources with a prospect action. 
uh, but only if you meet the tech requirements listed, luxury metal oil uranium icon, for instance, you need metallurgy stage four before you can prospect Middle East oil. All right, so let's go and show that. So to be able to prospect Middle East oil, you would need level four metallurgy. And again, this is a sieve game as we all have known to come and think about sieve games, but it's on a bigger scale. And as it said at the beginning, we are not a supreme being. We are the folks that are actually out here on the board. Then it says each hex is either a permanent ocean, a shelf, or continental. So we kind of have a good mix of things here on the camera. A permanent ocean hex always contains a blue circle. So blue circles like so, right? A shelf hex always contains a blue ring indicating that it contain a sea climate shit if flooded. So a blue ring like so. A continental hex is any other hex, either with a white, orange, green ring, or none. All right. So, as you can see, the different colors there. Then there's permanent ice, which is way up north. There you go. You can see these guys. They're not habitable and are shown because they can prohibit movement in the far north. And permanent ocean... Uh, no land folk city are allowed there. All right. So it kind of gives you an idea as to what those are. Um, and then it's got some graphics that sh uh, basically point out everything that we just went over. But all right. Easy enough. Then there are pawns. So these pawns here. start. You start with seven of these to represent the intelligentsia of your civilization. So there, then there's domain pawns. These are stored in three domains on your brain placard. Those are free in free will, can be specialized into elders. Through prayer, the pawns in any domain are able to be transferred to mysticism, pool on the map, etc., etc. All right, then there are migrant figures and migrant figures kind of, oops, there we go, look like people, as you can see there. Those represent migratory hunter-gatherers while on the map or striker protesters while on dissidents. Move them from your pool to the map during spread, etc., etc. Then the city cuboids, as mentioned earlier. And then there are regular cubes. And I'm trying to find some of the regular cubes. Don't see any right off, so bear with me. All right, cubes are used on the six tech tracks to start which stage you're at, plus a one on the diversity track, a purple cube goes on the philosophy track. All right, easy enough. So we're talking about the various tracks that are out here down there, okay? All right, then there are climate chits. If the climate changes, so these climate chits, as you can see here, double-sided to all of these. So depending if the climate changes, you're going to be changing the climate, etc., whatever. Like so, I imagine. Then there are victory chits. So let me grab those. And after I kind of list what all these are, I'm going to try and give you all a little bit of context and myself, for that matter, for said context. Let me figure out what I did with the... Victory chits. Oh, they're there. They're right here on the board. There you go. And it says victory points. Double-sided. There we go. Easy enough. Then there are crown chits. One side determines which discipline starts as your ruling class. And also, who is the starting player in the first turn? Uh, after the first turn, flip it to its other side with a dissident, where one dissident can be stored. I'll be honest, I do not know which one that is. Oh, yes, I do. I apologize. I just got to find them. Here they are. Crown chits. Wait for it. Look like crowns. There we go. So. 
All right, easy enough. Then there are the hex chits, which these start on the hex sheet side of the map if using the custom map variant. Um, the custom map variant being the other side of the board. And here, let me actually show you guys this stuff. Instead of just talking about it, we have it in front of us. Let's do so. So as you can see, you can actually make your own continents here if you want. Or you can use the Kratons that came in uh, Bios Megafauna 2. Right? Kind of change things up however you want to, et cetera, et cetera. Right? So you can customize this and play it however you want if you prefer not playing on Earth. You guys have pretty much now seen all the components except for the cards themselves and the player mats, the brains. All right, so let's go backwards and do so. So the placards, so let's move the board out of the way for right now and let's talk about these placards. So these are double-sided so we have like exoskeleton. Hydroskeletal. So it all depends on if you're playing the uh, campaign game or not and obviously there is one more you can start as a hobbit right so to give you guys an idea of what you're looking at all right so let's go over how these are described you uh, each player starts with two placards of their color a brain and a species so this being the species so let's go ahead and start with the sapiens all right, let's, let's say we had that one there. That means if it's the Sapiens, it's going to start with that. Now, obviously, this wouldn't be placed here. This would actually be placed something along the lines of like this because you're going to have, need room for a tableau of cards both above and below your tableau. But to be able to zoom in, and keep everything nice and tidy so you guys can see it. Now, if we were playing on the other side, it would look like so, and respectively. Okay, but. All right. The brain placard says it's divided into three domains to store pawns as emotions, vocabulary, or free will. So we have emotions, vocabulary, or free will. So you're going to have your uh, pawns there. As shown, encephalize, uh, abstraction, expand, artisan, specialized art, and prayer move pawns between these domains and to and from the mysticism pool on the map. All right. Uh, nope, not going to show you guys that yet. All right, then up here we have the species placard. This organizes the three columns of the tableau of each player. This card is permanent and its actions can't be shut down. A crown-shaped chit on a player's species uh, placard called a crown indicates what their ruling class is. The crown contains a dissident icon which can hold one dissident. So you'll notice that you have ru the ruling class. So one of these three is going to correspond with, so if you were culture, be corresponding with this part of the board. If you were there in politics, it would correspond with the politics aspect. And of course, with industry would correspond to that part of the board. All right. So again, we're just kind of giving a overview without a lot of context, I realize, of the different components that are in the game right now. Then there are three types of cards. All right, so let me go ahead and move these bad boys out. 
There are foundation cards. Let me get everything out of their bags. So yeah, as you can see, there's really not a lot to this game. Um. <laughs> A moment I'm trying to separate the cards and I didn't want to do this ahead of time for the simple fact that uh, I didn't want uh, I wanted this to be a pseudo unboxing as well all right so there are foundation cards and we're gonna bring this in even tighter for this part all right so Foundation cards. Each foundation is marked in the upper right-hand corner as to what epoch it is. So you can see that this is an epoch one card. If the religious icon, a star, appears next to it, and let me give you a example of that, like that. So you can see the little star in the top right-hand corner. Okay. Uh, you can use Mystical Bid Augmentation to help win this card. Each also contains two events which occur when the card is challenged and a Eureka when it is awarded if you win the auction for the card. And then it says a little bit for the advanced game. If there's an icon following the requirement, then the card has a requirement which must be met to take it into one your tableau. Then there are idea cards. And a moment while I get those. So those are foundation cards. Then idea cards. Bring it back out for this. There we go. These enter the game via the market. And if you invent or copycat, uh, or copycat invent an idea, you gain the Eureka advantage. Uh, there are four Comet cards placed into the challenge deck and indicate when an Epoch advances and Comet scoring occurs. After use, each one is awarded to the challenger as a bellwether. So, this being a bellwether on there. Age 1, or Epoch 1, Epoch 2, that's upside down, sorry it said comment on it, try that again, there we go, Epoch 3, Epoch 4, alright, so there we go. Yeah, a few hours might be an exaggeration, they did this actually at Origins, um, there was a group that played Bios Genesis, went into Megafauna 2, then, uh, I heard that Phil and Yoon were going to bring this to them so they could try this and then roll into High Frontier, which is pretty amazing. So that's all the cards. You guys have now seen everything that is in this game except for one thing. And I'm going to say this hopefully not to scare anybody. It's intimidating, but I think it's also really important to show the scope of the game. This Rosetta Stone right here. What this is, it shows a list of the available actions that are in this game. From abstraction down to zoonic, uh, zoonotic disease. All right, so we'll take uh, here, like Civil War is a crisis event. If dissidents are greater than or equal to diversity, then suffer to chaos. So this is just a big player aid for all the players to understand what can happen and what their available options are. So trade is a transaction. Spread to an enemy map token, expend your migrant, and both players receive a negotiation. Or a library, knowledge or elder action. Expend a number of elders equal to your information stage and advance your information by one step. So it, it, it's super, super intimidating when you look at the number of these, but as I go through these, that's pretty simple. Um, pollution is an event. 
If the number of your cities is greater than your energy stage, suffer one chaos, plus expend one elder, or destroy one city. So this actually is, all of the individual actions are relatively simple, so it seems. There's just a handful of them, or two handfuls of them, as it were. So if you guys want, I can go ahead and set this up as if it were a two-player game, just to show you guys what it would look like. Um, yeah. Does that sound good? Now that we've gone over everything. Oh, I guess I before we do that, uh, let's discuss the uh, setup variants, uh, setup and variants, the different variants. So the basic game ignores the rules in the blue font, okay? And it says re recommended for your first game or if you want a shorter play time. The advanced game includes the blue font rules, including Part J, Culling, Negotiation, Milankovitch, Cycles, Inventions, Transactions, Morality, and Elder Actions. All right, so you have to choose first if you're going to play the basic or the advanced game. Then, classic, custom, or a custom Kraton map. Players decide if they wish to use the classic or the custom map. The classic map is the one with the continents on it, obviously. For a custom map, either use the Kratons from Bios Megafauna 2 or use the 26 Punch-Out Hexes, which you don't have to have it, but the, the Kratons, but there you go. You can use these, set it up how you wish to do so. Arrange either side of the hexes in any way the players choose. Each player chooses their starting spot uh, with the player with the number one crown number starting. Then choose, is it going to be land or marine realm? Decide if you jointly wish to play as land folk or as merfolk. And that's going to restrict the entire game being either to land or in the sea. And then decide if the advanced game is the first or the second dispersal. So the standard advanced game starts with the second dispersal out of Africa 100,000 years ago. The longer advanced game begins far earlier during the first dispersal out of Africa two million years ago. This long advanced game starts with more pawns in emotion, six instead of four, and more cards in epoch one, two per player plus two, all right? So historically, it has a little bit of what uh, where the players would start. So that said, Thorsten says this game sounds less a game than an exam. It's really, I don't think that's going to be the case at all. I think uh, it looks intimidating, it looks big, and it is a big game. But I think once you get over the initial learning curve, I think this is going to be quite the game unless the experience, like some games in the past of this magnitude have been. So let's go ahead and set it up, shall we? Let's see what it looks like. I've seen it at Origin set up. So we'll go ahead and that there. I'm going to have to zoom out further, guys. Sorry. This is going to be a perfect example of us getting the PTZ camera. Going to be really beneficial for a game like this. And we're going to be streaming this likely in the September time frame. Okay? All right. So, here we go. Set up. Landfolk non-campaign. Okay, and we'll set it up for the second as if it were the advanced game, but the second one, not the super long version uh, in this. So each player is randomly assigned a color, receives their colors 10 cuboids. That's all the player pieces in one color. So as if it were Jess and I playing this as a two player, um, probably would be better actually to put them down here. I apologize. Okay. Also place their colors, uh, species placard and brain placard in front of them with an appropriate realm land or sea face up. And it does have a little thing here talking about the two player game. Uh, plays best as either Sapiens versus Hobbit or Neanderthal versus uh, Denisovan. And, well, I mean Sapiens versus Hobbit, right? 
Well, you know what? We're not going to because I have the colors out here. So Denisovan uh, versus Neanderthal. Okay, fine. Never mind. We'll do Hobbit because, I mean, yeah. So Hobbit versus Sapiens. So that would be green versus black. So I'll put those back. All right, take care, Vince. Sorry, lost my spot on the rule book. There we go. All right, so we need the brains. So the Hobbit brain, we'll go ahead and put that right there. This is actually going to have to be further down like so. And if I need to zoom in on things, I can do so. And we'll just put that right there. Okay. All right. And I would need the black pieces as well. So brain placard pawns. You know what? I'll actually just set it up using Jess's pieces over here. You start the game with all seven pawns on this placard. Uh, in the standard game, four pawns start as emotions. So one. Two is vocabulary. And one as free will. So there may be extra pieces because, again, prototype, right? I'm doing this wrong. Pawns. I apologize. Try this again. It actually shows a graphic in the rule book of this. I'm just trying to expedite and going too quick. I apologize, y'all. All right. There. Uh, all right. Then, if we were playing the first dispersal game, um, we would start with six pawns as a motion and one as free will. So these two in vocabulary would actually start back down there, okay? Um, starting migrant figures. Each player places one of their migrants on the land spot on the map marked with their player color. Land spots are bright brown, light brown in color. Uh, so let's see, we're looking for green. So this would be Indonesia. Need to flip the board to the right side. There we go. I'm looking a moment. All right, so in Indonesia, it says it's a light brown spot. Ah, would start right there. Actually would be standing up, but you get the idea. So if you guys can see that, you can see where the circle right here, whether it's in what, uh, merfolk or land. So we're playing land one, so it would go right there. It has the green border outline right there. Okay. And the black piece would, in theory, start in Zimbabwe. And right there. I was looking too far north. There we go. All right. Place 11 migrants into a pool next to your brain placard. Place the final migrant next... Uh, per the next bullet. All right, so all of the migrants then would then start off board kind of like so, okay? Place a cube for each player in the game and the first stage of each of the six tech tracks in the number one spot on the diversity track. So number one spot of the diversity track and one on each, so on the, sorry, on the first stage of each, so that would be like so.
Oh, you know what? We got extra pieces for this because the cuboids are going to start out here on these. I apologize. Dee, 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 dee. So I'm curious, out of y'all watching right now, how many of y'all either back the Kickstarter, are looking forward to this, had a clue about it, or is this completely new to all of y'all? Personally, I'm super stoked for this. I really am. There we go. All right. Oh, and you know what? We'll put that marker there for diversity. Again, prototype. There we go. So that is kind of set up already for green now. Then it says the philosophy cube. Place the purple cube in the center of the philosophy track on the map in the spot labeled start philosophy. And that would be right there. And that, again, prototype, so we don't have the purple cube. So you, if you're familiar with Pax Ren, it's going to look a lot like there. There we go. All right. Is this, are you guys enjoying this, seeing the setup and everything as we go along here? I hope. Uh, I'm not wasting y'all's time. Then we have to place the climate chits. Some hexes have climate rings with star icons. On the center of each of these hexes, place a climate chit of the same color as the ring, either white, blue, orange, or green, as modified by the bullets below. In a two-player game or solitaire, place chits on any ring with stars. So there's a total of 32 of those bad boys. Well, you know what? I said we're going to set it up, so let's set it up. Here we go. Okay, so some hexes have climate rings with star icons. So we're looking for ones. With, oh, okay, got it. I see. So we have to place climate chit of the same color as the ring. Okay, a moment. Double checking, making sure the climate chits are these bad boys I have in my hand. Yep. Okay. So the climate chits. So anywhere that we see like these. So for instance, and it matches that color. So starting climate discs, it actually says here. Okay. It shows right here and I'll zoom in a little bit so you guys can see that so that's what we're going to be doing at the uh, disc at start of a two player uh, at a solo or two player okay so anywhere you see these rings with stars on them we would have to put out these discs for a two player There should be a total of 32. Nope, no star on that one. The good news, now you guys, uh, podcast listeners, there's going to be a number of interviews coming from Origins, including one I did with Yoon and one with uh, Matt Eklund that talks about uh, Pax Transhumanity, which also looked fantastic, by the way, uh, that said you're going to be able to order this either on the Ion Game Design or the uh, Sierra Madre uh, website. So FYI on that. Uh, so I think that's it over there. This is actually easier than I thought it was going to be, so that's, that's encouraging. I 
miss it? Yep. It's actually really clear. I hope, oh, I didn't zoom back out. I apologize. Uh, I hope uh, that I'm conveying that this is actually uh, very clear. I hope it is for you guys at home as well. Because these actually, once you get used to what you're looking at on the board, it becomes really clear. It's a prototype, so I might not have all of the ones that I need. I apologize. So let me see. What am I missing here? Um, I'm missing. So I have two left over. So I have one green there. Aha. Are there any others? Oh, there's a water up here. And it's either water or ice that I overlooked. Oh, there it is. Boom. There we go. So we have all of the chits out now. Okay. Then we have to form the challenge deck. Sort the challenge card to Epoch. Uh, and for each epoch, randomly select as many cards as the number of players in the game. So, as a reminder, the challenge cards, those are foundations. Okay, ideas, got to get organized, all this stuff, there we go. Okay, so challenge cards, say, challenge on it, epoch one, pretty clear. Sort the challenge cards into four decks by epoch, and for each epoch, randomly select as many cards as the number of players in the game. For example, there'll be a total of 12 cards for a three-player game, three challenge cards from each of, okay, so there should be eight. All right, so one, two, 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 and you guessed it, two. So I just randomly grabbed a couple off of there. All right. Stack these four decks face down on top of each other, top with Epoch 1 on top. Okay, easy enough. Stack these four decks, so they're going to look like that for a two-player game. Okay. Uh... Stack these four decks face down on top of each other with Epoch 1 on top. Put a comet between each deck. All right, let me figure out what I did with the comet cards. They're hiding. Got them. Okay. Oh, okay, at the end of each Epoch. Okay. Oh, okay, and we're supposed to turn these out. Okay, got it. Okay, here's what it says to do. So, like so... And it says to put those uh, 90 degrees out so that people can see how many cards, how many challenge cards are left until the end of the epoch. All right. So there's that. Uh, the number of challenges in the first epoch can have an additional card depending on the va variant. So we're playing the uh, advanced game. Epoch 1 should have two challenges per player. Um, and that says the first dispersal game epoch, two challenges per player, plus two, um, etc. So, okay. So there's that. Now we have to form the idea market. We're going to do that over here. 
Sort the idea cards into the three disciplines, culture, politics, and industry, and further divide those into four epochs. So basically what we're talking about here is, let me show you guys. So we have like epoch one, politics. Then we have epoch two, and you'll notice that the color of the background has changed for each of these. So it's actually really easy to go through and see those. That's as an example, okay? This leaves you with 12 small piles. Shuffle each of the 12 piles face down and place them in a four by three matrix as shown uh, with the three draw decks of each of the epoch one to the left to right order. Okay, so if that's the case, we're going to need a little bit more space. So, there's actually a really good graphic, and I'll show you guys. In the bottom right-hand corner, it shows how it's supposed to be set up. So, this is going to take up a fair bit of space, so we're actually going to have to move player board down here. Okay, so these actually need to be something along the lines more like this, vertically. They're not perfectly aligned, I apologize, but you get the idea. And this is why, uh, why it takes me a while to set this up to make sure everything fits on camera. So we have like so. Then draw three cards from each of these decks and place them in a column below each draw deck. This forms a three by three matrix called the market. So what I'm gonna do now is we're gonna move this over to the other side and Kind of move this over so you guys can see. So, and it said, so I'm going to, so this, again, it's prototype. They're still refining this. I'm going to assume that we actually draw three from the current epoch, right? So if that's the case, you could actually move those off camera uh, for right now. So we have, to give you an idea, that would be, there we go. So that would be one, two, three. But I don't think you would actually, you could actually have all of those stacked up and off the area or off uh, to the side so that you don't need this much table space, which is exactly what we're going to do when we stream that. I see this now, because that is a ton of space and it's unnecessary. All right, then the crowns are number one to four in a two player game, only use crowns one and two. Randomly assign each player one of the crowns. Each player has a discipline color or each has a discipline color and each player places the crown on the column with this color, then all players flip their crowns to the other side so that a dissident is visible. So we would grab this and let's say for justice sake, she is player two. So that would be the ruling class there. So that would go like so, okay? Then there's a boost if you get the number four crown in a four player, which this will either be a three or four player game when we stream it. And there you go. There is your setup, roughly. Here, let's do it this way. There is your setup for what it's supposed to look like, okay?
that's really not that bad. I mean, now that I've actually gone through it, it would take me about a quarter of that time to go, to go through. Then, it, to briefly go over the actual flow of how the game works. So the sequence of play now says, on your turn, so there's three phases per turn, and on your turn, perform the following three phases. Challenge, activities, and footprint slash restore the market. You must play all the epochs, and there is no player elimination. It says that it's easily missed, that there's no early game end. It points that out, okay? So we'll zoom that a little bit. There we go. So the first player, the player with the number one crown marker, takes the first turn, then go to the next player clockwise in round-robin fashion until a player claims the fourth and final comment in the challenge deck which ends the game immediately, then each player calculates final scoring. See, easy game, guys. So, st step one is challenge. To begin your turn, choose one of these four. Either challenge the gods, claim a comet, globalization, or skip the phase. So those are your options. Then it goes into a little bit more detail. So, challenge the gods. If there's no comet visible, and there isn't, Reveal the top challenge card and perform the turns event icons applied uh, top to bottom to all players. So let's go ahead and kind of give an idea of what that looks like, shall we? I figure if you guys are hanging out, we might as well do that. So let's see what it would be. So switching over here, there. Top to bottom to all players, all right? Then... Auction the challenge card as a foundation. Each player needs at least one elder to participate in the auction. The player winning the auction receives the Eureka, the immediate perk, which is going to be that. Uh, and if they meet the tech requirements, place the foundation into his tableau. Easy enough. Then... If that wasn't visible and it were the, cl the comet, if there's a comet visible, the challenger claims it without an auction, performs the steps, then proceeds directly to his activities phase. What's that look like? Well, if this top card were visible, all players shuffle, uh, suffer a chaos, renovate all ideas, Again, context, I understand, but there you go. The other option is globalization. As an alternative to revealing a card, you can discard a bellwether and move the philosophy one or two steps. So, these become bellwether cards, okay? And move philosophy one or two steps. What does that mean? That means this here. So now I'm going to mess up everything that we nicely did to be able to zoom in on the philosophy track. Yeah, right, there we go. There you go. So you'd be able to move that one or two steps. So I'm assuming much like Churchill or something, you work towards the middle. So it'd be like there, one, maybe up there to two, etc. Or you skip this phase, it says. So there we go. Then the activities uh, part of the round, which is step two, or the second phase. Choose and perform up to one action or advancement on each card in their ruling class column on their tableau. So let's go ahead and look at this for a second, if we can. Let me zoom this back out, too, for you guys. All right, so taking a look at your tableau here, you're going to have cards, and I believe that these are foundations. I believe that they go down here, and ideas will actually come up to the top and tucked in. I believe it's like so. I think so. Um... The cards can be species, idea, or foundation cards. You can skip cards, but actions advancements must be selected 
and that's a bad idea. That actually would have to go because they're color coordinated. So this being this matching here, or if it were over there, it would be like so. And then to finish your turn, you do the footprint and restore market. Check all your tokens on the map. Choose which ones to destroy. If any hex has more tokens, then you have footprint. Migrates are cities, so destroyed. Create chaos. That sounds bad. Then if there are any gaps in the market, moving that back out. If there are any gaps in the market down here, you would refill those. You, can, uh, you may also in this fa phase ask other players to adjust their cubes in diversity to accurately reflect the number of unshattered rainbows in their tableau. There we go. Rinse and repeat. Do that until all of those cards are gone and the, uh, the last comic card is taken. So there we go. All right. So that's it. That's all there is to this game. It's got a lot of moving parts, but I'm going, I will say that uh, this Rosetta Stone is going to be invaluable. And you know what I just realized? I, you guys really are going to want to see this. I apologize. On the back of the Rosetta Stone, and we're going to zoom in pretty tight on this, it has a little flow chart. Okay? So, so, Start here. Challenge the gods. Do you, uh, do you wish to? It's yes or no. Yes are the blue, red are the no's. Okay? So, and the white ones are conditions, the yellow ones are procedures. So you can see that it says here, challenge phase A1, challenge phase 2, Okay, so let's say, nope, we're not going to challenge the gods. So we basically skip that phase. Then in order uh, from bottom to top in the ruling class column, and again, the ruling class being whichever one has your crown on it. So even if you have cards in these other areas of your tableau, only your ruling class are you going to actually take the actions in it. Uh, so from bottom to top of your uh, tableau, choose one action on each foundation or idea card. You can skip cards as long as the order is preserved. Foundations with dissidents are shut down. The species card with two rows can't be shut down. All right. Then your different options based on the Rosetta Stone there. So you do that and then destroy any tokens, fill any gaps in the market, and that's the end of your turn. Easy enough. However, if you wish to challenge the gods, do you have a bellwether? Meaning, uh, let me, do you have one of these? Do you wish to discard it? If no, move philosophy one or two steps and then come back down to there. Okay, easy enough. However, if you do reveal the topmost challenge card, is it a comment visible? No. Perform. Two event icons from left to right. Does warming or cooling occur? If the answer is no, then auction it, and it goes through the auction. And then you come back over. After all of that, at the bottom, it then follows that arrow right here and goes back to the, active uh, the actions phase. So this is actually going to be hugely beneficial early on. And I, honestly... I would argue that this probably becomes somewhat irrelevant after you get a feel for the flow of the game. And then we have all of this stuff, which again, the individual actions themselves are not hard. And only, you're only going to be able to take certain actions at certain times, depending on the type of land or water that you're on, as well as the time of the game that you're in. So. That all makes sense. That all seems relatively straightforward. So there you go. This is going to be one of the most important components in the game, both that flowchart as well as the Rosetta Stone. So there you go. All right, an hour and 20 minutes, I realize. That was a while, but hopefully uh, you guys enjoyed it. I'm stoked about this. 
I am a huge fan of civilization games. Through the ages, for the longest time, was my number one game. Still in my top three, top five, somewhere in there. I am super excited about this. This is, uh, this is a Civ game on steroids. This might be the Civ game that I want to play. Because to me, if I'm playing a civilization game, I want it to feel epic. I want to be like, okay, guys, we're going to sit down and we're going to play this amazingly epic story of civilization. Let's do that. And if it takes four or five hours, I'm okay with that. But with less players, I mean, in solo, from what I'm gathering, two to four hours, uh, when you listen to the interview I did with Yoon at Origins, he talks about how, yeah, it's going to take longer until you get the hang of it. Once you get the hang of it, it flows right along. I'm stoked for this. I hope you guys are as well. You're going to see this streamed either in August or September. And whichever month it isn't, you're going to see Pax Transhumanity streamed uh, the other month. So if this is in August, Pax Transhumanity in September or vice versa. So there you go. That is, uh, that is Bios Origins. I'm excited to dig into this. I hope you guys are. There we go are excited to uh, have me dig into it, which means hopefully ease the learning curve for everybody there watching at home. And figure out a good way to keep the teach efficient while also going over the details of most everything that you're going to encounter during the game. So there you go, all right? Yeah, this is going to be, uh, this is gonna be a lot of fun. I hope you guys are excited for it as well. So thanks everybody for watching. Thanks for spending uh, your Tuesday afternoon with me. If you guys liked it, like and subscribe. You want to support what we're doing here at the show, then go to pledgehc.com and support the show there. It would be massively beneficial for the show and hopefully beneficial for y'all. Y'all get access to the Slack channel. You get access to my teaching notes, which for a game like this, I imagine is going to be uh, pretty beneficial and other perks like that. Plus, when we get to 800 patrons, we're going to upgrade and get an additional camera for the show to be able to zoom in on specific things so we don't have to move the board around and it will just be a snap to camera. So what benefits us in turn, so help us help you help us help you. Symbiotic, right? That's how it's supposed to be. So thanks everybody. I'll be back tomorrow night at 9 p.m. with our uh, patron voted live stream. That's another per perk. You get to vote on a live stream each month. Martin Wallace's automobile. So thanks, everybody. Hopefully you all enjoyed it, and I'll see you all tomorrow. Take care.